From Into Thin Air by John Krakauer Straddling the top of the world, one foot in Tibet and the other in Nepal, I cleared the ice from my oxygen mask, hunched a shoulder against the wind, and stared absently at the vast sweep of earth below. I understood on some dim, detached level that it was a spectacular sight. I'd been fantasizing about this moment and the release of emotion that would accompany it for many months. But now that I was finally here, standing on the summit of Mount Everest, I just couldn't summon the energy to care. It was the afternoon of May 10th. I hadn't slept in 57 hours. The only food I'd been able to force down over the preceding three days was a bowl of ramen soup and a handful of peanut M&Ms. Weeks of violent coughing had left me with two separated ribs, making it excruciatingly painful to breathe. 29,028 feet up in the troposphere, there was so little oxygen reaching my brain that my mental capacity was that of a slow child. Under the circumstances, I was incapable of feeling much of anything except cold and tired. I'd arrived on the summit a few minutes after Anatoly Bokriv, a Russian guide with an American expedition, and just ahead of Andy Harris, a guide with a New Zealand-based commercial team that I was a part of, and someone with whom I'd grown to be friends during the last six weeks. I snapped four quick photos of Harris and Bokriv striking summit poses, and then turned and started down. My watch read 1.17 p.m. All told, I'd spent less than five minutes on the roof of the world. After a few steps, I paused to take another photo, this one looking down the southeast ridge, the route we had ascended. Training my lens on a pair of climbers approaching the summit, I saw something that until that moment had escaped my attention. To the south, where the sky had been perfectly clear just an hour earlier, a blanket of clouds now hid Pumori, Ama Dablam, and the other lesser peaks surrounding Everest. Days later, after six bodies had been found, after a search for two others had been abandoned, after surgeons had amputated the gangrenous right hand of my teammate Beck Weathers, people would ask why, if the weather had begun to deteriorate, had climbers on the upper mountain not heeded the signs? Why did veteran Himalayan guides keep moving upward, leading a gaggle of amateurs, each of whom had paid as much as $65,000 to be ushered safely up Everest, into an apparent death trap? Nobody can speak for the leaders of the two guided groups involved, for both men are now dead. But I can attest that nothing I saw early on the afternoon of May 10th suggested that a murderous storm was about to bear down on us. To my oxygen-depleted mind, the clouds drifting up the Grand Valley of Ice, known as the Western Coombe, looked innocuous, wispy, insubstantial. Gleaming in the brilliant midday sun, they appeared no different from the harmless puffs of convection condensation that rose from the valley almost daily. As I began my descent, I was indeed anxious— but my concern had little to do with the weather. A check of the gauge on my oxygen tank had revealed that it was almost empty. I needed to get down, fast. The uppermost shank of the southeast ridge is a slender, heavily corniced fin of rock and wind-scoured snow that snakes for a quarter mile toward a secondary pinnacle known as the South Summit. Negotiating the serrated ridge presents few great technical hurdles, but the route is dreadfully exposed. After fifteen minutes of cautious shuffling over a seven-thousand-foot abyss, I arrived at the notorious Hillary Step, a pronounced notch in the ridge named after Sir Edmund Hillary, the first Westerner to climb the mountain, and a spot that does require a fair amount of technical maneuvering. As I clipped into a fixed rope, and prepared to rappel over the lip, I was greeted by an alarming sight. Thirty feet below, some twenty people were queued up at the base of the step, and three climbers were hauling themselves up the rope that I was attempting to descend. I had no choice but to unclip from the line and step aside. 
The traffic jam comprised climbers from three separate expeditions. The team I belonged to, a group of paying clients under the leadership of the celebrated New Zealand guide Rob Hall, another guided party headed by American Scott Fisher, and a non-guided team from Taiwan. Moving at the snail's pace that is the norm above 8,000 meters, the throng labored up the Hillary Step one by one, while I nervously bided my time. Harris, who left the summit shortly after I did, soon pulled up behind me. Wanting to conserve whatever oxygen remained in my tank, I asked him to reach inside my backpack and turn off the valve on my regulator, which he did. For the next ten minutes, I felt surprisingly good. My head cleared. I actually seemed less tired than with the gas turned on. Then abruptly, I felt like I was suffocating. My vision dimmed, and my head began to spin. I was on the brink of losing consciousness. Instead of turning my oxygen off, Harris, in his hypoxically impaired state, had mistakenly cranked the valve open to full flow, draining the tank. I just squandered the last of my gas going nowhere. There was another tank waiting for me at the south summit, two hundred fifty feet below. But to get there, I would have to descend the most exposed terrain on the entire route without benefit of supplemental oxygen. But first, I had to wait for the crowd to thin. I removed my now useless mask, planted my ice axe into the mountain's frozen hide, and hunkered on the ridge crest. As I exchanged banal congratulations with the climbers filing past, inwardly I was frantic. "Hurry it up! Hurry it up!" I silently pleaded. "While you guys are messing around here, I'm losing brain cells by the millions." Most of the passing crowd belonged to Fisher's group. But near the back of the parade, two of my teammates eventually appeared: Hall and Yasuko Namba. Girlish and reserved, the forty-seven-year-old Namba was forty minutes away from becoming the oldest woman to climb Everest and the second Japanese woman to reach the highest point on each continent, the so-called Seven Summits. Later, still, Doug Hansen, another member of our expedition. A postal worker from Seattle, who had become my closest friend on the mountain, arrived atop the step. "It's in the bag!" I yelled over the wind, trying to sound more upbeat than I felt. Plainly exhausted, Doug mumbled something from behind his oxygen mask that I didn't catch, shook my hand weakly, and continued plodding upward. The last climber up the rope was Fisher, whom I knew casually from Seattle, where we both lived. His strength and drive were legendary. In 1994, he'd climbed Everest without using bottled oxygen, so I was surprised at how slowly he was moving and how hammered he looked when he pulled his mask aside to say hello. Bruce, he wheezed with forced cheer, employing his trademark frat boyish greeting. When I asked how he was doing, Fisher insisted he was feeling fine. Just dragging a little today for some reason. No big deal. With the Hillary step finally clear, I clipped into the strand of orange rope, swung quickly around Fisher as he slumped over his ice axe, and rappelled over the edge. It was after two thirty when I made it down to the south summit. By now, tendrils of mist were wrapping across the top of twenty-seven thousand eight hundred and ninety foot Lotse. And lapping at Everest's summit pyramid, no longer did the weather look so benign. I grabbed a fresh oxygen cylinder, jammed it onto my regulator, and hurried down into the gathering cloud. Four hundred vertical feet above, where the summit was still washed in bright sunlight under an immaculate cobalt sky, my compadres were dallying, memorializing their arrival at the apex of the planet with photos and high fives. And using up precious ticks of the clock, none of them imagined that a horrible ordeal was drawing nigh. None of them suspected that by the end of that long day, every minute would matter. At three p.m., within minutes of leaving the south summit, I descended into clouds ahead of the others. Snow started to fall. In the flat, diminishing light, it became hard to tell 
where the mountain ended and where the sky began. It would have been very easy to blunder off the edge of the ridge and never be heard from again. The lower I went, the worse the weather became. When I reached the balcony again, about 4 p.m., I encountered Beck Weathers standing alone, shivering violently. Years earlier, Weathers had undergone radial keratotomy to correct his vision. A side effect, which he discovered on Everest and consequently hid from Hall, was that in the low barometric pressure at high altitude, his eyesight failed. Nearly blind when he'd left Camp 4 in the middle of the night, but hopeful that his vision would improve at daybreak, he stuck close to the person in front of him and kept climbing. Upon reaching the southeast ridge shortly after sunrise, Weathers had confessed to Hall that he was having trouble seeing, at which point Hall declared, Sorry, pal, you're going down. I'll send one of the Sherpas with you. Weathers countered that his vision was likely to improve as soon as the sun crept higher in the sky. Hall said he'd give Weathers 30 minutes to find out. After that, he'd have to wait there at 27,500 feet for Hall and the rest of the group to come back down. Hall didn't want Weathers descending alone. I'm dead serious about this, Hall admonished his client. Promise me that you'll sit right here until I return. I crossed my heart and hoped to die, Weathers recalls now, and promised I wouldn't go anywhere. Shortly after noon, Hutchison, Task, and Kashishki passed by with their Sherpa escorts, but Weathers elected not to accompany them. The weather was still good, he explains, and I saw no reason to break my promise to Rob. By the time I encountered Weathers, however, conditions were turning ugly. Come down with me, I implored. I'll get you down, no problem. He was nearly convinced, until I made the mistake of mentioning that Groom was on his way down too. In a day of many mistakes, this would turn out to be a crucial one. Thanks anyway, Weathers said. I'll just wait for Mike. He's got a rope. He'll be able to short rope me. Secretly relieved, I hurried toward the south call, 1,500 feet below. These lower slopes proved to be the most difficult part of the descent. Six inches of powder snow blanketed outcroppings of loose shale. Climbing down them demanded unceasing concentration, an all but impossible feat in my current state. By 5.30, however, I was finally within 200 vertical feet of Camp 4, and only one obstacle stood between me and safety. A steep bulge of rock-hard ice that I'd have to descend without a rope. But the weather had deteriorated into a full-scale blizzard. Snow pellets born on 70-mile-per-hour winds stung my face. Any exposed skin was instantly frozen. The tents no more than 200 horizontal yards away, were only intermittently visible through the whiteout. There was zero margin for error. Worried about making a critical blunder, I sat down to marshal my energy. Suddenly, Harris appeared out of the gloom and sat beside me. At this point, there was no mistaking that he was in appalling shape. His cheeks were coated with an armor of frost. One eye was frozen shut and his speech was slurred. He was frantic to reach the tents. After briefly discussing the best way to negotiate the ice, Harris started scooting down on his butt, facing forward. Andy! I yelled after him. It's crazy to try it like that! He yelled something back, but the words were carried off by the screaming wind. A second later, he lost his purchase and was rocketing down on his back. Two hundred feet below, I could make out Harris's motionless form. I was sure he'd broken at least a leg, maybe his neck. But then he stood up, waved that he was okay, and started stumbling toward camp, which was for the moment in plain sight, one hundred fifty yards beyond. I could see three or four people shining lights outside the tents. I watched Harris walk across the flats to the edge of camp, a distance he covered in less than ten minutes. When the clouds closed in a moment later, cutting off my view, he was within thirty yards of the tents. I didn't see him again after that, 
but I was certain that he'd reached the security of camp, where Sherpas would be waiting with hot tea. Sitting out in the storm, with the ice bowl still standing between me and the tents, I felt a pang of envy. I was angry that my guide hadn't waited for me. Twenty minutes later, I was in camp. I fell into my tent with my crampon still on, zipped the door tight, and sprawled across the frost-covered floor. I was drained, more exhausted than I'd ever been in my life. But I was safe. Andy was safe. The others would be coming into camp soon. We'd done it. We'd climbed Mount Everest. It would be many hours before I learned that everyone had in fact not made it back to camp, that one teammate was already dead, and that twenty-three other men and women were caught in a desperate struggle for their lives. Meanwhile, Hall and Hansen were still on the frightfully exposed Summit Ridge, engaged in a grim struggle of their own. The forty-six-year-old Hansen, whom Hall had turned back just below this spot exactly a year ago, had been determined to bag the summit this time around. I want to get this thing done and out of my life, he'd told me a couple of days earlier. I don't want to have to come back here. Indeed, Hansen had reached the top this time, though not until after 3 p.m., well after Hall's predetermined turnaround time. Given Hall's conservative, systematic nature, many people wonder why he didn't turn Hansen around when it became obvious that he was running late. It's not far-fetched to speculate that because Hall had talked Hansen into coming back to Everest this year, it would have been especially hard for him to deny Hansen the summit a second time, especially when all of Fisher's clients were still marching blithely toward the top. It's very difficult to turn someone around high on the mountain, cautions Guy Cotter a New Zealand guide who summited Everest with Hall in 1992 and was guiding the peak for him in 1995 when Hansen made his first attempt. If a client sees that the summit is close and they're dead set on getting there, they're going to laugh in your face and keep going up. In any case, for whatever reason, Hall did not turn Hansen around. Instead, after reaching the summit at 2.10 p.m., Hall waited for more than an hour for Hansen to arrive, and then headed down with him. Soon after they began their descent, just below the top, Hansen apparently ran out of oxygen and collapsed. Pretty much the same thing happened to Doug in 95, says Ed Viestures, an American who guided the peak for Hall that year. He was fine during the ascent, but as soon as he started down, he lost it mentally and physically. He turned into a real zombie like he'd used everything up. At 4.31 p.m., Hall radioed base camp to say that he and Hansen were above the Hillary step and urgently needed oxygen. Two full bottles were waiting for them at the south summit. If Hall had known this, he could have retrieved the gas fairly quickly and then climbed back up to give Hansen a fresh tank. But Harris, in the throes of his oxygen-starved dementia, overheard the 431 radio call while descending the southeast ridge and broke in to tell Hall that all the bottles at the south summit were empty. So Hall stayed with Hansen and tried to bring the helpless client down without oxygen, but could get him no farther than the top of the Hillary step. Cotter, a very close friend of both Hall and Harris, happened to be a few miles from Everest base camp at the time, guiding an expedition on Pumari. Overhearing the radio conversations between Hall and base camp, he called Hall at 5.36 and again at 5.57, urging his mate to leave Hansen and come down alone. Hall, however, wouldn't consider going down without Hansen. There was no further word from Hall until the middle of the night. At 2.46 a.m. on May 11th, Cotter woke up to hear a long, broken transmission, probably unintended. Hall was wearing a remote microphone clipped to the shoulder strap of his backpack, which was occasionally keyed on by mistake. In this instance, says Cotter, I suspect Rob didn't even know he was transmitting. I could hear someone yelling. It might have been Rob, but I couldn't be sure because the wind was so loud in the background 
He was saying something like, keep moving, keep going, presumably to Doug, urging him on. If that was indeed the case, it meant that in the wee hours of the morning, Hall and Hansen were still struggling from the Hillary Step toward the South Summit, taking more than 12 hours to traverse a stretch of ridge typically covered by descending climbers in half an hour. Hall's next call to base camp was at 4.43 a.m. He'd finally reached the south summit, but was unable to descend farther. And in a series of transmissions over the next two hours, he sounded confused and irrational. Harold was with me last night, Hall insisted, when in fact, Harris had reached the south call at sunset. But he doesn't seem to be with me now. He was very weak. Mackenzie asked him how Hansen was doing. Doug, Hall replied, he's gone. That was all he said, and it was the last mention he ever made of Hansen. On May 23rd, when Brasiers and Visters of the IMAX team reached the summit, they found no sign of Hansen's body. But they did find an ice axe, planted about 50 feet below the Hillary Step, along a highly exposed section of ridge where the fixed ropes came to an end. It is quite possible that Hall managed to get Hansen down the ropes to this point only to have him lose his footing and fall 7,000 feet down the sheer southwest face, leaving his ice axe jammed into the ridge crest where he slipped. During the radio calls to base camp early on May 11th, Hall revealed that something was wrong with his legs, that he was no longer able to walk and was shaking uncontrollably. This was very disturbing news to the people down below, but it was amazing that Hall was even alive after spending a night without shelter or oxygen at 28,700 feet in hurricane-force wind and minus 100-degree wind chill. At 5 a.m., base camp patched through a call on the satellite telephone to Jan Arnold, Hall's wife, seven months pregnant with their first child in Christchurch, New Zealand. Arnold, a respected physician, had summited Everest with Hall in 1993 and entertained no illusions about the gravity of her husband's predicament. My heart really sank when I heard his voice, she recalls. He was slurring his words markedly. He sounded like Major Tom or something, like he was just floating away. I'd been up there. I knew what it could be like in bad weather. Rob and I had talked about the impossibility of being rescued from the summit ridge. As he himself had put it, you might as well be on the moon. By that time, Hall had located two full oxygen bottles, and after struggling for four hours trying to de-ice his mask, around 8.30 a.m., he finally started breathing the life-sustaining gas. Several times he announced that he was preparing to descend, only to change his mind and remain at the south summit. The day had started out sunny and clear, but the wind remained fierce, and by late morning the upper mountain was wrapped with thick clouds. Climbers at Camp 2 reported that the wind over the summit sounded like a squadron of 747s, even from 8,000 feet below. Throughout that day, Hall's friends begged him to make an effort to descend from the south summit under his own power. At 3.20 p.m., after one such transmission from Cotter, Hall began to sound annoyed. Look, he said, if I thought I could manage the knots on the fixed ropes with me frostbitten hands, I would have gone down six hours ago, pal. Just send a couple of the boys up with a big thermos of something hot, then I'll be fine. At 6.20 p.m., Hall was patched through a second time to Arnold in Christchurch. Hi, my sweetheart, he said in a slow, painfully distorted voice. I hope you're tucked up in a nice, warm bed. How are you doing? I can't tell you how much I'm thinking about you, Arnold replied. You sound so much better than I expected. Are you warm, my darling? In the context of the altitude, the setting, I'm reasonably comfortable, Hall answered doing his best not to alarm her. How are your feet? I haven't taken me boots off to check, but I think I may have a bit of frostbite. I'm looking forward to making you completely better when you come home, 
said Arnold. I just know you're going to be rescued. Don't feel that you're alone. I'm sending all my positive energy your way. And before signing off, Hall told his wife, I love you. Sleep well, my sweetheart. Please don't worry too much. These would be the last words anyone would hear him utter. Attempts to make radio contact with Hall later that night and the next day went unanswered. Twelve days later, when Brasiers and Vistas climbed over the south summit on their way to the top, they found Hall lying on his right side in a shallow ice hollow, his upper body buried beneath a drift of snow. Early on the morning of May 11th, when I returned to Camp 4, Hutchison, standing in for Groom, who was unconscious in his tent, organized a team of four Sherpas to locate the bodies of our teammates Weathers and Namba. The Sherpa search party, headed by Lakpa Chiri, departed ahead of Hutchison, who was so exhausted and befuddled that he forgot to put his boots on and left camp in his light, smooth-soled liners. Only when Lakpa Chiri pointed out the blunder did Hutchison return for his boots. Following Bukreev's directions, the Sherpas had no trouble locating the two bodies at the edge of the Kangshung face. The first body turned out to be Namba, but Hutchison couldn't tell who it was until he knelt in the howling wind and chipped a three-inch thick carapace of ice from her face. To his shock, he discovered that she was still breathing. Both her gloves were gone and her bare hands appeared to be frozen solid. Her eyes were dilated. The skin on her face was the color of porcelain. It was terrible, Hutchison recalls. I was overwhelmed. She was very near death. I didn't know what to do. He turned his attention to Weathers, who lay twenty feet away. His face was also caked with a thick armor of frost. Balls of ice the size of grapes were matted to his hair and eyelids. After cleaning the frozen detritus from his face, Hutchison discovered that he, too, was still alive. Beck was mumbling something, I think, but I couldn't tell what he was trying to say. His right glove was missing, and he had terrible frostbite. He was as close to death as a person can be, and still be breathing. Badly shaken, Hutchison went over to the Sherpas and asked Lakpachiri's advice. Lakpachiri an Everest veteran respected by Sherpas and Saibs alike for his mountain savvy, urged Hutchison to leave Weathers and Namba where they lay. Even if they survived long enough to be dragged back to Camp 4, they would certainly die before they could be carried down to base camp, and attempting a rescue would needlessly jeopardize the lives of the other climbers on the call, most of whom were going to have enough trouble getting themselves down safely. Hutchison decided that Cheery was right. There was only one choice, however difficult. Let nature take its inevitable course with Weathers and Namba, and save the group's resources for those who could actually be helped. It was a classic act of triage. When Hutchison returned to camp at 8.30 a.m. and told the rest of us of his decision, nobody doubted that it was the correct thing to do. Later that day, a rescue team headed by two of Everest's most experienced guides, Pete Athens and Todd Burleson, who were on the mountain with their own clients, arrived at Camp 4. Burleson was standing outside the tents about 4.30 p.m. when he noticed someone lurching slowly toward camp. The person's bare right hand, naked to the wind and horribly frostbitten, was outstretched in a weird frozen salute. Whoever it was reminded Athens of a mummy in a low-budget horror film. The mummy turned out to be none other than Beck Weathers, somehow risen from the dead. A couple of hours earlier, a light must have gone on in the reptilian core of Weathers' comatose brain, and he regained consciousness. Initially, I thought I was in a dream, he recalls. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Finally, I woke up enough to recognize that the cavalry wasn't coming, so I better do something about it myself. Although Weathers was blind in his right eye and able to focus his left eye within a radius of only three or four feet, he started walking into the teeth of the wind 
deducing correctly that camp lay in that direction. If he'd been wrong, he would have stumbled immediately down the Kangsheng face, the edge of which was a few yards in the opposite direction. Ninety minutes later, he encountered some unnaturally smooth, bluish-looking rocks, which turned out to be the tents of Camp 4. The next morning, May 12th, Athens, Burleson, and climbers from the IMAX team short-roped weathers down to Camp 2. On the morning of May 13th, in a hazardous helicopter rescue, Weathers and Gao were evacuated from the top of the icefall by Lieutenant Colonel Madan Katri Chetri of the Nepalese Army. A month later, a team of Dallas surgeons would amputate Weathers' dead right hand just below the wrist and use skin grafts to reconstruct his left hand. After helping to load Weathers and Gao into the rescue chopper, I sat in the snow for a long while staring at my boots, trying to get some grip, however tenuous, on what had happened over the preceding seventy-two hours. Then, nervous as a cat, I headed down into the icefall for one last trip through the maze of decaying Seracs. I'd always known, in the abstract, that climbing mountains was a dangerous pursuit, but until I climbed in the Himalayas this spring, I'd never actually seen death at close range, and there was so much of it, including three members of an Indo-Tibetan team who died on the north side just below the summit in the same May 10th storm, and an Austrian killed some days later. Eleven men and women lost their lives on Everest in May 1996, a tie with 1982 for the worst single-season death toll in the peak's history. Climbing mountains will never be a safe, predictable, rule-bound enterprise. It is an activity that idealizes risk-taking. Its most celebrated figures have always been those who stuck their necks out the farthest and managed to get away with it. Climbers, as a species, are simply not distinguished by an excess of common sense. And that holds especially true for Everest climbers. When presented with a chance to reach the planet's highest summit, people are surprisingly quick to abandon prudence altogether. Eventually, warns Tom Hornbein, 33 years after his ascent of the West Ridge, what happened on Everest this season is certain to happen again.